Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church St. Mount. I'm glad that you're here worshiping today. Hopefully you have found uh, your bulletin and you're ready to worship the Lord today. Hopefully you have a to do that. Uh, the most important announcement of uh, the next coming weeks, we're going to hear a lot about this, is Vacation Bible School. Um, that's going to be at the end of June. Sure you can participate uh, with us in some way, shape, or form. Um, you can volunteer to be with the kids. You can help us out um, preparing things and maybe some arts, perhaps, with the uh, preparation process. And if you would like to know more about how you can help please talk to me, or to Holly, or to Kathy, one of us will be able to help with that process. Um, also, uh, we still have a couple weeks left of the adult Bible study that happens on Wednesday evenings. And look at the, uh, the information that we're going to have a reading list. It's pretty We'll get an email that you can have Zoom link to it. All in. So we hope that you will participate in that. Um, also, we're going to hear a little bit now from Mark Curtis. He was able to uh, help us orchestrate everything. Uh, Shot Clinic was much fun. He's got some great news to share with us. Thanks, Pastor Mark. Good morning, everyone uh, here at Church and on uh, Facebook. Um, I just want to thank everyone helped to participate in, in the vaccination clinic on Friday here, uh, especially Andy Peace and Don Morris and other volunteers. Um, I'll tell you, at first, when I got the results of them, I found out that we had 79 people in shots Friday. I admit I was a little disappointed. I thought we were going to get the full 300 to give all those gift cards the city put out. And so I was texting with Dr. Sherry Young, the head of our health department, this here Friday. She's a friend of mine. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm sorry we didn't get more people up. She said, don't apologize. She said, you've got 79 people who got shots that may not have ever gotten. She was, that's a really good turnout. And you guys did a great job, especially with the advanced publicity. And so I started feeling a lot better about it. We did a lot of advanced publicity on Channel 13. Channel 3 showed up. Channel 3 showed up and did stories on Friday. And I got to thinking, the thousands of impressions, tens of thousands of impressions, Thursday and Friday, that the public got of this church and what our mission is, made me feel really good. That's 79 people who got brochures for PBS, 79 people who got brochures about this church and what we're doing. The people we touched Friday, that's our mission. Remember when we did our mission statement two years ago? It's right here on the front page of your book. A community beacon of faith, love, and hope. And when we crafted that mission statement, we said, we're going to do more outreach in the community. We can't count on people just showing up here uh, uninvited. We're going to reach out, we're going to do good things to the community, we're going to shake hands, make impressions, tell our story, and that's going to fill these pews next week. So with that in mind, uh, I want to thank everyone. I apologize. I think Peter Friday is supposed to be you knowing. I was in the hospital having a procedure. Uh, we don't have the results yet. The procedure went flawlessly, and so I ask for your continued prayers for my health. Anyone else here dealing with health issues? But God bless you all. We, uh, we, really, made a, uh, we really made a splash last week. A lot of people know about First Presbyterian St. Albans that never heard of us before. Thank you. And now it's his brainchild, so he doesn't want to take credit for it. He's staying hard for that. So that's great. Hopefully you read the newsletter this week. You saw that we're trying to follow the science, as we've said from the beginning of this whole pandemic. And so if you have been vaccinated, um, you don't have to wear a mask in worship. Encourage to think about others in that process. We're also going to start trying to get back a little bit more normal. Uh, so we're going to actually serve communion. That's the way the Lord kind of taught us in the Bible to do. So if you're okay and comfortable to serve communion today, uh, the elders are going to wear masks and they're going to bring the elements to you during communion. If you don't want that to happen, that's okay too. Uh, I would encourage you to go back out into the fellowship hall, grab one of the communion packets out there. We hope that you are excited about maybe getting back a little bit of the tools from out of us here at First Pressing Office. Let's now prepare our hearts to worship. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
And now let us pass the peace of the Lord. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. 
Hear these words of the call to confession. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Therefore, let us corporately confess our sins. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. Amen. Friends, hear this assurance of pardon that comes to us from the Old Testament. See, I have set your sins as far away as the east is from the west, that your sins may be as scarlet, I have washed them white as snow. The good news in Christ's coming to earth is that he separated us from our sin, that our old life is gone, and a new life remains. So know that you have been forgiven, and be at peace, and pray also for me, a sinner. Amen. seated. Our first Testament reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between you, your offspring, and hers. He will strike your head, but you will strike his heel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. At this time, I invite the children to come forward for a children's sermon. Awesome sweatshirt. Okay, what do I have here? It's a pencil. What can we do with this pencil? Hmm? Can we write stuff with this pencil? Why not? So we might be able to use the eraser though, right? Okay, so there's a pencil that has a working eraser 
but doesn't have a working piece of lead. What can we do with this pencil? We can write with it, but what can we not do with it? We can't erase. Why? Because there's no eraser. So what do you think about this pencil? We can do both of the things. It has a good eraser and it has a good pencil, right? So most people would look and say, this amongst these three is the most correct pencil. Would you guys agree with me on that? That this is like the best thing that we could use right now, okay? So that's how most of the world works. They look and they say, okay, this has a good enough this and a good enough that, so it's good enough. But sometimes we see things like this and it doesn't work and maybe even... Maybe even neither end this works. Like there's no pencil lead now, and now there's no eraser. And so what do you think we should maybe do with that? What, can, what are our options? We could throw it away. Is there anything else we might be able to do with it? We could resharpen it, but it still doesn't have a very good eraser, right? So we'd have to buy an eraser to put on the top of that. And so most people, they just want to kind of get rid of those things. They look at this new pencil, and they say, this has potential. We could do a lot more with this pencil than we can with this pencil as soon as this one gets sharpened, right? As soon as it's ready to be used, it's good to go. Well, the reason I bring you these three pencils today is because it reminds me of what the story that I'm getting ready to read in the Bible says about what Jesus says about the earth. Most of the time, back in Jesus' day, if people were like this broken pencil and they couldn't be an eraser and they couldn't be used to write, all of society just wanted to get rid of them. They just wanted to throw them away. If they had a certain disease, they would put them in a specific place and just wait for them to die. They wanted things back then to be almost perfect, like brand new, or at least still have some life left in them. And so these are the people that, in Jesus' day, the church kind of paid attention to. And they ignored the broken people, the broken pencils. They just wanted to be thrown away. So Jesus came, and guess what Jesus did? He restored the old pencils to make them look brand new again. He healed people, and he welcomed them to be part of his life. And so all the people in the church said, wait a minute, this guy's crazy. He does stuff that we're never supposed to do. He goes around sick people, and he eats with women, and he does all this crazy stuff that men are just never supposed to do. And so they wanted to kill him. And his family found out, that he was doing these crazy things and they came and said to all the crowds and even to the church just let him come home with me he's clearly lost his mind he's crazy we'll get him out of here because they were embarrassed that Jesus liked broken pencils now I'm not going to ask you if anybody in your family is crazy but there may have been a time or two where somebody in your family embarrassed you a little bit has that ever happened to you where you've been a little bit embarrassed right so Jesus' family was really embarrassed because he loved these broken pencils. And so they just wanted to get him out of the crowd. But all of the broken pencils were doing everything that they could to get closer to Jesus because he saw how much, they saw how much he loved them and they wanted to be a part of his life because they could make, they could be made whole by Jesus. And so Jesus said this weird thing. Somebody came from outside and said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here and they want to take you home. And Jesus looked at them and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? The people that want to be around me and love me for who I am, that's my family. And so just like a few weeks ago when I told you that Jesus lets us call God dad, at that time Jesus said, anybody that does the will of Jesus, the will of God, they're part of my family. And so part of what I want you guys to do, I know that school is out for you already, right? And it's getting ready to be out for you. So pencils are probably not even something you do in school anymore, but they were when I was in school, right? We had to worry about our pencils. You guys have to worry about your laptops and stuff. But what I want you to do with the rest of your life is to always think the way that Jesus thinks and to not just throw away people just because they're different or they think differently or they look differently or maybe even smell differently. Don't just throw them away. Look at them the way that Jesus looks at them, like this pencil, and says, I can make that person whole again. I can make them perfect, and then they'll be ready to be used for the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Okay, let's pray. Dear God, you rock, and we love you. And we're so glad that you can fix pencils. 
And we're also glad that you can fix people. Thank you for fixing us. Please help us fix other people. We love you. Amen. Okay, go sit down. Our New Testament reading today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 20 through 35. And I will say that it kind of starts off weird, um, but I'll explain why it starts off weird in just a second. So 20 through 35. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub. And by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first trying, tying the strong man up. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, Jesus has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside, asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. May the Lord add blessing and understanding to the reading and hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you so much for this day that you have given to us, and we thank you for your story. We ask God now that your spirit be upon us and allow us to discern the meaning of the story as it applies for us this day. We ask these things in the name of your son. Amen. This past week, there was uh, a pretty significant celebration in the world. We Americans typically don't celebrate it quite as much as some other parts of the world um, do. But do you know what happened on June 2nd this uh, this past week? you know what the significance of June 2nd is? We seceded from this place, and so we don't really pay much attention to it anymore, right? But uh, June 2nd was the 69th anniversary of the coronation of Queen, Queen Elizabeth, right? 69 years she's been the queen. And I got to thinking about that. That's, uh, that's one year away from 70, right? That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. But do you know that if right now Queen Elizabeth and Prince Charles suddenly die and William has to take the throne, he has to live and reign until the year 2080, his 98th year of life, to reach the same accomplishment that his grandmother has reached. That, I think, is pretty impressive, right? And I think that many people may argue that, you know, the monarchy is not nearly as important as it once was. It's kind of a figurehead leader uh, and has been since the Magna Carta. But she is an undeniably amazing and attractive source of attention and great source of pride for Great Britain and for the United Kingdom. And I think she's celebrated. Would you agree that she's pretty much, people pretty much love Queen Elizabeth? Would you agree at least with that statement? Now, I'm old enough to remember that her life is not perfect. You know, in the mid-90s, early 90s, in fact, the year 1992, she named a year, and I'm terribly with, terrible with Latin, Honus Horribilis. 1992 was the year that her three oldest children all filed for divorce. 
it was not a happy thing for the Holy Family. Her reign had been riddled with family strife from the beginning. Even the fact that she is the queen came upon the tail end of her uncle abdicating the throne and giving it to her father. And if you trace her ancestry back even further, you'll see that there are several instances where the family had splits. Their family even murdered other portions of their family. People were denied lineage. And there were the creation and extinction, extinction of multiple houses of reign in the monarchy of Britain. And knowing the history of the British monarchy, simply put, it is a hot mess. There have been times in the royal lives where they were embarrassed of each other as family members, and they simply, simply didn't claim other members of the family. And as amazing as she is, and I think her nation is amazing as well, Queen Elizabeth II owes a great deal to family and a recognition, at least for the last almost 70 years, of a united house. I'm happy to be back in Mark's gospel this week. And, and this, like I said at the beginning before I read the text, it kind of starts off in a, in a weird way. Um, but Jesus is said to be going home. And, and, and it's, it's a weird little statement because what immediately precedes that is that Jesus had chosen the 12 disciples, whom he also called apostles, and he had been really, really tired. We're only in the third chapter of Mark when this is taking place, but people are already starting to find out a great deal about Jesus. And he had gone up on a mountain and called the disciples to him, and he went up on that mountain just to kind of get some rest. And now we pick up this part of the lection, and it says... And he is returning home. And if you go back to chapter 2 and read it, um, there's this other place where Jesus is supposedly going home as well. And on that occasion, scribes uh, had been present and they were questioning in their hearts what Jesus was doing. So we already have at the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, the religious leadership questioning Jesus' ministry. Following that episode, Jesus begins the new community of faith, and he calls the first disciple Levi. And then he engages with the critiques of the Pharisees, and in a highly provocative action, he healed somebody in the synagogue. And that took place in Capernaum, and it took place on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees and their kind of weird partners, the Herodians, finally agreed on something, and what they agreed on was that they had to destroy Jesus. Then great multitudes follow Jesus. Great multitudes of people follow him. And then, like I said, he goes up on the mountaintop. And now he's coming home. And in theory, this home that he's returning to in chapter 3 is the home where he was in chapter 2, verse 2. Um, but it's not, really, it's not really certain that that's the case, but that's the best guess the biblical scholars can say. So he's not, the point that Mark is trying to make is he hasn't traveled very far from home, yet his reputation is growing in vast numbers. The great crowd around Jesus makes normal life difficult. If you've ever um, known anybody that suddenly became famous or they've done something really important like there for their quick flat 15 minutes of fame at least, people want to be around them all the time. In this instance, they could not even get to the front door. Now they can't even get bread. The people who come to Jesus are not enthusiastic followers. They're not really people to be healed. The Greek that's here is hoi par atu. And that literally translates as the ones alongside him. And normally this would refer to like compatriots or disciples um, but it's really not what's going on there. The, this is this is the this is a huge following that Jesus already has, and it's not disciples because the immediately preceding text tells us that he called a very specific twelve to be his disciples. And so we don't really know what this is, but that phrase in Greek typically connotates family members, and that's the weird parallel that's happening. In our text today, the hoi par atu would typically be his extended family. But, but they're not the extended family because we know <laughs> that the family, the, the, the Jesus' real family, comes alongside them in this story. 
It's the only time that we're really kind of introduced in Mark's gospel, at least, to the family. In chapter 6, we'll kind of hear a little bit more of, of a story where they say, people are saying, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not these his sisters here with us? That's pretty much all we hear about Mark's nuclear, or Mark's nuclear, Jesus' nuclear family in the gospel of Mark. And, and here, the family is not really introduced as the greatest, most supportive family. The family wants to take hold of Jesus, and, and Rod, probably in their mind, the spin that they might put on it is that they want to grab Jesus to protect him. But chances are, the fact that they said he's beside himself or out of his mind, really what they're probably trying to do is protect their family reputation and protect themselves. And why would they why would they say that Jesus is crazy? Like if we were to say that in the 21st century, if we were to say if we were to openly publicly claim that one of our members of our family had a mental illness, there's a procedure that the authorities have to then follow in order to find out if that's an accurate statement. If they were to name Jesus as someone out of his mind and and think this way, When they say out of the mind, think about the accusation that the Pharisees and the scribes have made about Jesus. They have said, he's filled with what? The devil. Right? So if the family is then saying he's out of his mind, that's another way of saying, I think they're right. He may have an unclean spirit within him. So Jesus has caused his family to want to like protect him but grab him out of the spotlight. He's caused the church leadership at the time, the synagogue leadership, and now we see even people from Jerusalem have come to judge what this guy is doing. He stirred up such a mess, and he's doing this radical thing. The, the crazy thing that Jesus is doing is he's saying that sick people should be healed, that people should pay attention to those who are suffering, and they want to say he's crazy. There's no doubt that the family has been monitoring all of these things. And maybe the maybe Jesus' family is truly concerned about his physical safety, but I really think it has a lot more to do with maintaining family honor. If Jesus is seen as a radical, that would be to the detriment of the family's reputation. And in this period of Israel's history, there have been other people that have led uprisings against Rome or against Jerusalem or against, you know, just in like the Decapolis. And usually that person is ultimately put to death. So maybe because they know that history, maybe they just don't want Jesus to die. Their motives, I think, are to protect him. But by coming to seize him, they are giving validity to the charge of madness. And that puts Jesus in the leagues of the devil. It would be hard for me to comprehend how Jesus would have heard that accusation from his family. And I think that's something that we all probably need to like hold in tension. That Jesus' family was willing to say, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And he's, he's working for the devil. And I think I would probably immediately try to lash out and defend myself and say, how dare you make such a radical accusation? How? No, but that's not, that's not what Jesus does, is it? Jesus becomes a teacher. And Jesus says, how can Satan fight Satan? How can an evil entity fight itself if if that's what's going to happen if if there's a traitor in the midst of evil then that house has already decided it's going to fall now jesus also knows that this accusation is a way to completely discredit him it's a defamation of character and i think it's still probably today a very widely used tactic Every year that we have an election, those stupid ads on TV tell us how much better this person is than that person, right? And so Jesus says, I'm going to teach you 
that this is just not even possible. Your, your logic is flawed. If a house be divided against itself, that house will not stand. If Satan rises up against himself, he's already divided and can't stand. And this is the brilliance of Jesus. He had the potential to be upset and be defensive, but instead he says, these people, they just don't know yet. They don't understand. He ignores the accusation of insanity and he goes directly to the accusation about demon possession. I'm not possessed. But he raises the ante. He says, we're not talking about demons here. This is about Satan himself. Satan may be evil, but Satan is not a fool. Why would Satan ever pit two demons against each other? If Satan was here and he was trying to win all of us, he would make it look very attractive, not try to fight one another. It's a ridiculous charge on its face. And then he gives three parables. If there's division, the house cannot stand, the kingdom cannot stand, Satan cannot stand. Not only is Satan not powerful enough to stand against himself, Satan has an end. And that's a beautiful teaching that we might just overlook. Jesus is admitting, at some point in time, Satan ends. He may be powerful, but he's not all powerful. Satan's demise is drawing to an end. But no one is able to enter into the house of the strong one to plunder vessels, except the first one be bound, and then he will plunder the house. Truly I say to you, all will be forgiven the children of humanity, the sins and the slanders, however much they may slander. But whoever might slander into the Holy Spirit does not have forgiveness into the eternal, but is subject to an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now let me unpack that a bit for us. Jesus gets himself in more trouble here. And says, all sins are going to be forgiven. All sins. Now, that's directed specifically at the leadership of the people in Jerusalem. How do the scribes and the Pharisees and the Herodians, the people that run the temple, how do they get their, how do they earn their keep? How, how are they employed? Well, they're employed by people admitting that they have sinned and they have a sin offering. And they have to bring that to the temple and make that sacrifice at the temple. And then, based on the biblical law itself, the Levites get to distribute all of that stuff. They get the best cuts of meat that are put on the burnt offering. They get the best cuts of meat of the first offerings of the year that are they're the meat offerings, right? And so if Jesus says all sins are going to be forgiven, guess what? That offering plate's going to look a lot thinner. If I don't have to take the best sheep of my flock and give it to the Levites who are running the temple... If, I get, if I'm forgiven, if God can forgive me without a sacrifice, there's trouble in paradise, kids. Right? So Jesus says, all earthly sins are forgiven, except what? Sinning against the Holy Spirit. Now, this always troubled me as a child. I'm trying to figure out, Lord, I... I, I don't want to do anything wrong, but I certainly don't ever want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit because that evidently is unforgivable. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit is this. If you say, if somebody has an, an idea and say that, that this is the Lord, and they declare that this is what the Lord wants, and the Lord says this is the right way to do things, but you can't back that up biblically, or you're trying to do your own thing and then you just kind of rubber stamp it with God, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Worst case scenario is the Lord is literally doing something and you then say, that's Satan. That's the unforgivable sin. And he has just accused all of the religious leadership of the entire area as blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You folks cannot be forgiven. And these are the things that Jesus wanted to teach 
people. He wanted to teach that there's this idea that all should be welcome to the Lord's table. That the, that the handicapped, that the crippled, that the leprous, all of those people are welcomed into the kingdom of God. The people that had been divorced, the women who were caught in adultery, they're all welcomed in, into Jesus' kingdom. Their sins are forgiven. And unfortunately here, Jesus' family is kind of in cahoots with the synagogue leaders. They're portrayed as outsiders. The old uh, saying is that blood is thicker than water. And I think that's supposed to be right. But interestingly, I think what we all claim to be accurate is that, that Christ is the Savior of the world. And then the church, capital C, all Christians, I think we need to kind of get our act together Because in my opinion, Mark's opinion, not Mark Gospel, Mark Boyd. In my opinion, the church, Big C, most often falls in line with Jesus' blood family rather than those who want to be around Jesus. Why? Why I say such a thing? Because I think the church in and of itself is constantly splitting and dividing much like what Jesus would say Satan's demise would be, if the kingdom divides against itself, how can it stand? Do you know how many times a Presbyterian church has split since the 1600s? Google that today. You'll be shocked. Over some of the most insane ideas we've split. And we're just one branch, right? Think how many other denominations of Christians there are in the world. When I was a Baptist, I was having a conversation with one of the religious leaders at the time. Um, I was on staff there, and and we were having a conversation about who gets to go to heaven. And we were talking about Catholics. And my friend said to me, I think some Catholics get to go to heaven. And I looked at him and I said, and I think some Baptists do too. (laughs) Like the, the rules that we put on ourselves about who's in and who's out looks far more like Jesus saying that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so each week we go to our separate houses of worship with separate ideas, things that we segment and say, this is what we believe, this is what we think God is calling us to do, and then we try to get out of worship early so we can be the first ones in line at the restaurant, right? I'm I'm all for that. But I think the challenge is we need to start being more like those people who wanted to be as close to Jesus as we could instead of saying, that's a crazy idea, I don't like it, I'm going to cross my arms and go home. And then call myself a Christian. Since 2012, I've attended almost every General Assembly of our denomination. And typically when I come home, I'm far more upset about being a Presbyterian than when I went. Because we still fight over some of the stupidest things. Ridiculous things. Sometimes they actually become important theological matters. And sometimes it causes our denomination to splinter. And there have been a time or two where I've wondered about staying in PCUSA. Obviously I have. I'm still here. But what I think is more important is that we need to look at each other and say, not only are we siblings, but we're siblings to the people that have left our denomination. We're siblings to the fact that we left the Catholic Church. We're siblings to the Lutherans. We're siblings to the Baptists, to the Episcopalians, that biblically, they're all part of our family. And through the grace of Christ, we each have our own sins forgiven. And so maybe what's best for the church is to learn how to forgive and be gracious. Instead of holding a pompous view of how we may be better than another branch of our family. Let's allow Christ to rule in our lives in such a way that we constantly and consistently celebrate the kingship and the reign of of Christ. And we celebrate being part of his amazing lineage. And let's do that in the name of the Father 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Now let us stand and declare what it is that we believe in the recitation of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We come to the point in our worship this morning where we recognize that God has given us many gifts in this life and we're going to turn a portion of those gifts to them to him now. Uh, we're still not passing the offering plate, but if you would like to make an offering, so when you leave um, through the fellowship hall and at home, you can click the link. But let's now pause as we meditate on what God has given us as a blessing. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for the many gifts and blessings that you have given off, given us in this life. As we return a portion of these gifts to you now, God, we ask for your blessing and for your guidance and for your will to be done. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to this table, this is not our table, this is the Lord's table. So all who have been baptized in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit are welcome to participate with us in this holy food and drink. Let us now pray together the prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, 
Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched his arms out upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus took bread. And when he given to you, he given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in Him. And sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ. By Him, and with Him, and in Him, In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body and blood of Christ. The body and blood of Christ.
Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we thank you for this sweet foretaste of your kingdom come. We thank you, Lord, that through this sacrament you impart grace to us. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you love us and welcome us to be part of your family. We're thankful, Lord, for this, our church family. We're thankful, Lord, for the ministry and mission of this church, this place we call our church home. Bind us together, Lord, in this holy sacrament that we may love each other more each day. We pray, God, a thankful prayer for the freedoms that we have in this country. We're thankful, Lord, that we have the freedom to gather for worship. We thank you, God, that we live in a place that respects houses of worship, and the freedom to gather. We know, Lord, that this is not always something that all Christians experience throughout time or history or even this day. We pray, Lord, for our church family who gathers in secret, who whisper their prayers, but love you regardless. We're thankful, Lord, for the men and women who have historically fought to keep our country free, that we may have this freedom. We pray, Lord, that they may be coming home in a time of peace, we pray, Lord, for the leaders of the world that they would seek peaceful solutions to avoid war, where we may be able to beat our swords into plowshares. We pray, Lord, for our president, for the leaders of our nation, for our governor and state leaders, for our local officials, wherever, Lord, someone governs over us. We pray that you would be patient with them as they discern your still small voice. We're thankful, Lord, that as the school year is coming to a close for many students and children, we thank you, Lord, for those who have been called to the Ministry of Education. We pray, Lord, for a safe summer for those who will experience time off from school. We're thankful, Lord, for all the great freedoms that we have, and as we look forward to growing closer to you and to each other, We thank you, Lord, for the scientists who have been able to provide documentation that allows us to get back to a life of more normality. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick, for those in hospital. We pray, Lord, for those who are grieving and mourning the loss of a loved one. We pray, God, for those who have received a diagnosis that's not the greatest diagnosis. We pray for those who are awaiting a diagnosis. We pray for healing. And we're thankful, Lord, for the healers, those whom you have called to the ministry of healing. And because we are a family, Lord, we pray for those who are seated to the right and to the left of us, in front of us and behind us. And in the stillness of this moment, Lord, we pray for ourselves. God, we are amazed by your grace and the glory of your ways. Please bless us as we become blessings for others as we leave this place this day, Lord. Allow us to be your hands and your feet in your cosmos. We ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Please stand as you are able for the closing hymn as we meditate on the words, Give Thanks.
yesterday, my family and I got to travel to uh, Logan to celebrate the graduation of one of my cousin's children, and it was a great time to be together. Um, it was a great way for us to be a family. We uh, we haven't seen each other a great deal, obviously, because of the pandemic, but also because we have lived in, in multiple states for the past several years. So I got to see my oldest cousin, who uh, came up from South Carolina, and then my cousin that lives in Logan, and, and we got to play croquet yesterday together as a family. And I'm a little sunburnt, so I've been sweating quite a bit today because of that. And I got to teach my children, or try to teach my children a little bit about croquet, and, and they said, no thank you, That's that looks boring. <laughs> But for me and for my family, that's something that we looked forward to every time we got together was to set up the croquet. We would we would cut the grass down nice and short and, and we would compete with each other. And it was a blast. Like we had a, a fun time. But my uncle wasn't there. And that was tough. But it's a reminder to me of how important family really is. And I think if we as a church family could recognize the importance of that, we would be able to blow the world over. Thinking all the people that have influenced you in your life and your Christian walk and have have walked alongside you, that is such a gift. Today we have an opportunity to do something like that. At 1 o'clock we're going to meet back here at the church and go visit the most vulnerable that we have. And I invite you to think about doing that so that we can be with people who so badly want to be here with us. If you can think about doing that, I'd love to see you at 1 o'clock. In the meantime, whatever you do this week, do it in the name of the Lord. Now receive the blessing of the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. May He be with us all until we meet again here, or His kingdom come. Amen and amen.